I'll never forget the lessons passed along from my grandfather about how to avoid, protect, and defend yourself from skinwalkers when alone. Our family owns a large ranch in Utah, and we are often out in the middle of nowhere without a town for over 70 miles when we are running cattle. From the time we could read, our grandfather taught us lessons he learned directly from the Ute Medicine Tribe members about how to protect yourself and defend yourself from skinwalkers, if necessary. He said the main thing was to never show fear. Even if you were out in the middle of the wilderness, you had to remain confident. Skinwalkers feed on fear. They use the night, the uncertainty of the wilderness, and the defenselessness of a man in the middle of nature with only a knife or a gun to their advantage. This sounds general, but how do you really not show fear in nature, even if alone? Here is how it was broken down to me. Number one, always travel in pairs if you can. If you cannot, bring a dog. If you cannot, and I mean absolutely can't bring a dog, then you'll have to exert your dominance. Number two, Exerting your dominance camp version. The Utes use nature methods to exert their dominance. First and foremost, they would encircle their camps with a ditch about one foot deep and about 10 inches wide. The bottom of the ditch would be covered with bark and then overlaid with small pebbles so it looked like it had a cement bottom. Then, on the sides, 16 inch pieces of branch would be nailed into the sides to form walls on both. The tops of the pieces of branch were rubbed with a combination of sage and sap daily, and the trench, or the encirclement, was used as the latrine for the male members of the tribe. They would urinate in the trench all day, so the scent would be rife at all times. When mixed with sage and sap, the combo on top, it sent a clear message to the skinwalkers that this land was not to be penetrated. They did not stop here. They would collect sweat as much as they could, and place it in wooden casks. The men and women who had generated enough sweat would come to the casks and empty out. The casks were then taken and strategically thrown on the tallest trees around the camp, stretching as far as a quarter mile out. Each night, the casks were poured on a different set of trees, starting with the farthest out and working back inside. Finally, animal hearts were placed on pointed pikes alongside walking trails 10 feet up, so only birds could eat them. This practice ensured skinwalkers would never penetrate the actual radius of the camp. Obviously, this practice had its limits. The next part details with the out in the wilderness portion. Number three, exerting your dominance, the wild version. In the wild, one had to adapt but the Utes still stressed the urine, and if possible, the sage and sap mix and circlement. Because warriors and hunters didn't often have enough sage, or time to set up a full encirclement every night, with bark, pebbles, branch pieces, sage and sap, they would just focus on the encirclement. It is very important to note this. My grandfather stressed this over and over again. It was imperative that you created the encirclement before you set up camp and if at all possible, before sunset. All who could then urinate would. But the Utes took it a step further. They made sure to bring sacks of urine with them, made from elk lungs, and they would portion off a little bit along with their own, night by night, to ensure that the encirclement was well protected. To this day, my brothers and I do the same, but with gas tanks. They would also have a big bag filled with animal hearts, and lay out about two to four on pikes outside the encirclement every camp. Finally, if they could bring a few small casks of sweat, they would, but in its place, they would often bring a gelled mix of sap and sweat and paint them on the tallest trees near the camp. The other very important thing that they did when they were on their own was to create an abnormally large fire. This would usually be done at the front of a rock face to minimize the chances of a fire. The word my grandfather used to describe this was five feet high teepee. The larger than life fire will act as a deterrent when combined with the urine and animal hearts. Number four, exerting your dominance. 
These are general tips that to apply to all situations. No matter if you are alone or in a group, always create the encirclement. Bring extra urine if you can. Build the full encirclement if you can. Think. You want to send a message to all surrounding nature that you are the biggest and baddest predator around. This is how you do it. Obviously, we live in a day and age where the animal hearts aspect is a very difficult thing to procure. But that was an extra precaution anyway. Sweat. If you can get a bottle, bring it. If not, focus on the encirclement. Outside of that, there are other things one or many can do to keep skinwalkers at bay. Regulated and directed hard breathing. The Utes would do a four-second count-in and a four-second out count breathing ceremony upon setting up camp and just before bed. The regulated breaths show that you have the ability to change your breathing and to do so forcefully, something that no other animal has the ability to do. Screaming three times as loudly as possible. The Utes would do this just before bedtime and would always strategically place their camp in an area that would echo to send the message to skinwalkers all over the world that they were not afraid. Wearing animal skin. This would seem obvious for Native Americans, and it was, but the youths swore that the more skin they wore, even on the hottest days, the more protected they were. When the heat was unbearable, they would wear necklaces of deer and elk and horn. They believed that to wear animal skin, even as necessary, covering in the wild, was to send a message to the skinwalker that you were not afraid of dead animals. Regarding my grandfather, the reason the Utes gave him this insider knowledge that they have not shared with any white men before or after him is because he found a hoard of Jesuit gold and silver and offered them a significant amount for his find for information on other possible Jesuit missions in Utah. The conversation took on a whole different turn when my father revealed to them an experience he had with a skinwalker more than half century ago. I seriously need help and am terrified out of my mind. So I'll start off by saying I've never believed in anything paranormal. I'm a pretty science-based dude. I always look for a logical explanation and I still am for this encounter. So if anybody has any ideas, let me know. I don't have much time for leisure with work recently. Been having to accept some pretty awful shifts to get by with COVID times. So I've lost my ability to go on my evening walks, which are a method of stress relief for me. It had been a while since I had gone on one. So three nights ago, I decided to just go for a late night walk. I put on my headband flashlight and decided to take a path that I hadn't in ages. There's a small trail near the back of my neighborhood that goes about four miles deep into the woods. The plan was to walk about a mile and a half and take the parallel path to come back. I make it down to around 1.3 miles, according to my Fitbit, and I start getting that feeling that I'm being watched. I turn off my headlight and sit still to listen. At this point, I'm more concerned that there's a guy following me who is up to no good. I heard clear footsteps in the leaves off the trail, and they've been behind me for nearly five minutes. I stopped thinking it was an animal or another walker and became worried. Sitting there for probably three to four minutes, I hear nothing at all. I turn back on my headlight and decide to start walking quickly back home. About two minutes later, I hear footsteps again. This time it sounds different. Sounds like four feet instead of two walking, and it's walking at the same increased speed that I am. I turn around quickly with my headlight and my phone light and point it behind me. Silence. I get angry and yell out, leave me alone, I'm calling the cops, and if you come at me, I have a knife. Silence. I yell again to get the hell out of here and start walking towards where I heard the walking. About 20 yards out, hard to fully make out because the flashlight doesn't reach too far, I see what looks like a literal naked man running full speed on all fours into the woods. 
Normally, I chalk that up to drugs, but my area does not have a drug problem. And there were some details that led me to believe that it was not a person. For one, they were damn near hairless, completely bald, pale white skin. And of course, the way they ran on all fours just looked natural. Not like when you try and run on all fours and look stupid. It looked like its bone structure was designed to walk on all fours. There was no hunched look. Their back was flat. And they were fast. Last thing that happened was straight out of a horror movie. I hadn't heard anything in a while on my way back, but kept turning around just to be sure. With about 0.3 miles left to go, until I was in the clear, I hear a mad dash through the leaves. I whip around, and it stops on a dime. I see the edges of its head behind a tree, and yell loudly to try and intimidate. What I heard next, I'll never forget in my entire life. It crackled like a monkey, a noise I've literally only heard in nature documentaries. The tone was that of mockery, a predator having fun with me. It didn't stick around. I sprinted as fast as possible back home. I'd love to believe that there was some prank going on, or some rabbit, bald, diseased coyote, but I got a pretty clear look at it. It wasn't. It had human feet and human hands, a human head and a human buttocks, but nothing else about it was human. I called the cops after and told them that there was a man following me. I didn't want to say it was some creature because they think I was crazy. They didn't find anything, but they did see quite a bit of activity in the leaves and dirt, about 50 feet from where the trail was, leading far back into the woods before it got to a large stretch of grass where no footprints were seen. Please tell me I'm not crazy, and that this was some elaborate prank, or maybe a deformed man.